Good morning, Journey and guests. I'm so glad that you're here joining us for our second week of live streaming the sermon because of the uh, coronavirus and all the implications of that. Uh, here in Alaska, I'm told we have over 100 cases now, and there are uh, new cases being added here in the interior. So uh, this is what we're doing. Uh, just so you know, we will do this again next week. We won't have face-to-face -face services uh, as well next week. And just keeping you informed, we're watching what the governor does and what's said. And so just wanted to thank you for joining us and this in this unique way. And so glad you could be with us. Um, if you need help or, or want us to, uh, to help you in some way, the church phone number is 907-455-4433, just so you're aware of that. All right, let's pray and we'll get into the message this morning. Dear God, we come to you today, and some with really heavy hearts, some have lost their jobs for a time, some are watching businesses that they have worked and invested in uh, begin to wither before their eyes. Lord, there may be some who are sick who are watching. But Lord, we come to you today and we ask you to lift our eyes, to give us comfort and peace and hope, for you are the ultimate source and you are sovereign. Lord, we look to a glorious, incredible future because of you. Make us your confident and calm people, people who are light in the darkness, and I just ask that you would bless our time together. We ask these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So I want us to um, think about heaven today. And I want to start with just a story. I'm going to be a little bit intentionally vague because I don't want to uh, talk about a teacher specifically. But one of the kids here at Journey uh, mentioned a teacher at school that back when all of this started, the coronavirus, we started to hear some news about it, uh, told him, at least this is what he understood, said something to the effect of, well, it's going to get to Alaska and we're all going to die. Now, I hope that that child misunderstood what that teacher was saying. Uh, that's a little over the top. Um, clearly, it is a serious issue, uh, but the mortality rate, everything I read, is 1% to 5%. I, I think Italy, it's, it's higher than that, uh, maybe 10%, because their medical system has been overwhelmed. But we are people who are not just facing something like coronavirus. That's really not the ultimate problem. The problem is death itself. And so we need to understand that. You see, death itself, the death rate, I mean, if you take out Enoch and Elijah in the Bible and Jesus coming back from the dead, the death rate's 100%. That's what we have to be prepared for. That's what we have to face. Someday, all of us are going to die. That is part of life on this earth, on this planet, because of sin, because our... Adam and Eve, our forebears, our ancestors defied God. There is sin and death in this world, and we all join them. And so we need to understand that, and that is the ultimate problem. I was reading that somewhere in the world, every three seconds, someone dies. So stop and think about that. One, two, three. Someone in the world passes away about every three seconds. The reality is that we all look pretty good, and yet we're kind of like cut flowers that look good for a time, but the end is coming. And so it's interesting that God has put, the scripture talks about that he has set eternity in our hearts. Chip Ingram, author, says virtually every culture that has ever existed believes in an afterlife. We look around at this life, and we think there's got to be more. And so we as Christians have this breathtaking promise from God that there is a heaven, that there is a new heavens and a new earth, a place for us. And we get to experience the joy of that, and we can look forward to that. We can have confidence no matter what we face because of the promise of heaven 
I think of a story from the Second World War where a Christian leader, Evend Burgarv, uh, he was a Norwegian, and he was a bishop in the church there. And the Nazis had come to him, and they wanted him to change their liturgy, change their worship, so that um, it reflected the Nazis' philosophy and propaganda. And he said he would not do it. And they said, well, we will have you shot. And that Christian leader looked at those Nazi interrogators, and he simply said, go ahead, shoot me. He said, and what will you do then? You see, he had a confidence because the ultimate problem, death itself, had been solved in his life. Because he looked forward and believed the incredible promise of heaven that Jesus gives us. He says that he went to prepare a place for us. And so today I want to look at that place. I want us to be people with confidence that no matter what we face, that death, the ultimate problem, has been solved. Because it's not this particular disease. It could be an auto accident. It could be old age. It could be anything. The ultimate problem is death itself. But we have a promise that gives us hope and joy. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Revelation chapter 21. I want to read to you verses 1 through 8. And I should have mentioned there is a sermon outline link on the Facebook page if you want to have that in front of you. And there are some discussion questions at the end if you're with some folks that you can talk about at the end of this message. Revelation 21, 1 through 8 says this, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Now I want to pause here. Here is the future that God wants to give us. Here's the future that we as Christians can grab hold of and have confidence in because we have put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But he reminds us in this passage, the last verse, that there's another destiny if we don't make that decision, if we don't put our trust in Christ. It says this in verse 8, But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. And so, while I want to focus on heaven today, I want to acknowledge that we get to choose which destiny is ours. And we need to understand that without Christ, all of us get the second destiny. All of us get separation from a holy and good God. I mean, you might look at that list and go, well, I'm not a coward. I'm not vile. I haven't murdered anybody. But what about sexual immorality? What about um, idolatry? Idolatry is putting anything above God in your life. Haven't we all done that? Haven't you told a lie or two? That's listed as well. Sin separates us from God. Only in Christ can we have the confidence and look forward to his promise of heaven. See, heaven is God's incredible promise. You know, we're told in the Bible by author um, Herbert Locklear in his collection, All the Promises of God, that there are about 8,000 promises in the Bible. 8,000. One of my favorites is the promise of heaven and all the implications of it. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, the Apostle Paul writes this of heaven. He says, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. Stop and think about that, particularly the line, what no human mind has conceived. I submit to you that you and I, each of us, have too small a view of heaven. 
that we can't even comprehend it. We can't get it. Probably an inadequate illustration, but I think of a small child that has never been to Disney World in Florida. And their parents, his parents try to tell him about it, and he tries to imagine it, but he can't quite get it until he goes and experiences it. I think that's what heaven is like for us. Now, the promise of heaven has many parts, so I want to unpack a few of these promises. Not all of them, but some of them. God's promised heaven is a place of deep, rich relationships. Now, author Hank Hanegraaff says this, Imagine the greatest, deepest, and most fulfilling relationship you have ever experienced on earth. By comparison to what you will experience in heaven, it is but a shadow. I love that image. It's but a shadow. There is a special relationship with God in heaven that we get. If you look at our text again, Revelation 21, verses 2 through 4, we see God uses these metaphors, these pictures for us. talks about the bride, which is the church, dressed as a beautiful um, you know, woman waiting for her husband. This is one of the most intimate relationships, a husband and wife coming together, the image of marriage. That's a powerful image of a rich relationship. It also talks about, if you jump down to verse 7 of our text, that I will be their God and they will be my children. The parent-child relationship is another deep relationship, another rich relationship. And so God uses these kinds of images, these metaphors, these pictures, so that we can begin to comprehend what awaits us in our relationship with God. And I love what Chip Ingram says. He says, home is where you belong. Home is where you are loved. And heaven is a place, but it's also the person of God and the relationship with him. Heaven is also a special relationship with the rest of God's people. If you look at our text, verse 7, it talks about that we will be his children some of you have siblings, and hopefully they were good relationships. There, there are powerful relationships with the other people of God there. In Revelation chapter 5, verse 9, at the end of the verse, it talks about how there are people that Jesus has saved from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see, on earth, we have a tendency to divide. We divide by sometimes people group or education level or economics or language. I mean, language is a huge one. How do you connect with somebody if you can't speak their language? But in heaven, it's all united. We can all understand. We can all speak together. We can all come together. And so there's this incredible unity, this, this incredible relationship with God's people. There is real reunion that happens. I want to spend time at Heaven's Gates watching the reunion scenes. I love those. I, I'm a sucker for those videos where the military officer, th that man or woman, comes back. They've been gone on deployment for a year. I love seeing them surprise their kid at school and, and watching those. Those get me every time. There's something about reunion and coming together and having that relationship with God's people. You know, we have a foster son, or we did. He's not our foster child anymore, but we still have a good relationship with him. And we had him for about a year, not quite. And he was three years old at the time. And when he came to our home, you know, we had him for a while, but our family went on vacation. And because he was a foster child, they wouldn't let us take him with us for that short vacation. And so we had to leave him with somebody else for a period of time. And when we came back, um, it kind of broke my heart, but he was so happy to see us. And he said this, I'll never forget. He said, I thought I'd never see you again. Because in his life, there had been so much leaving. See, heaven is a place of reunion. Who are you looking forward to seeing again? Maybe it's Christian grandparents or Christian aunt or uncle or a mentor that you had earlier in your life that's now gone? Who are you looking forward to seeing? I think of a, a man in the church we served in Indianapolis named Clark who, who has now passed away. He's gone on to heaven. And he was really like an adopted grandparent to our family and to our kids. And I look forward to seeing him. I look forward to seeing my, my grandparents. What a great time that will be. 
Uh, my grandparents had a huge impact on my life. And so there are these special relationships with the rest of God's people. Now, we will be perfected. And so those relationships, even the deep ones here in this life, have moments of sin, moments of brokenness, moments of maybe betrayal. And you won't have that in heaven. You won't have any of that. We will get to experience all the good side, all the upside of relationships without the bad. And we get to know people and know them fully. You know, as a parent, it's been fun to watch our children. You kind of get to know them in, in stages. You begin with, remember when our, my wife was pregnant and I would talk to the baby still in the womb. You know, then we get those, those ultrasound pictures and we start to feel like we know them. Okay, it's a boy or a girl. And then the baby's born, and, and I enjoyed them as babies, but I love watching them grow and mature. And as they got older and older, you could have deeper conversations. You could get to know them better. You got to watch them grow and develop. You, know, you would see them have a heart for sports or have a compassion for people who are left out. Or you might be see, see them drawn to music or drama. And you just get to know them. And heaven gives us that time. And we get to have that perfect experience of getting to know people completely and well. And so it is this place of deep, rich relationships. The second major idea when I think about the promise of heaven is that God promises in heaven a new resurrection reality. And the big word here is restoration. In Revelation 21, verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So it's a place of restoration. Just a little side note, the, the sea idea, sometimes people struggle with that. Why no sea? Because some people love the sea. They love the ocean. But understand that John wrote this, and John was in, on an island and he was in exile. And for him, the sea represented division and separation from the people that he loved. And also in ancient cultures, often the sea was tied to storms and danger. And even uh, in Scripture, Isaiah 57, 20, there was this kind of tie with, with wicked people. It talks about, but the wicked men are like the tossing sea, which cannot rest, whose waves cast up mire and mud. And so for John, the sea was a negative image. But notice the new heavens and the new earth. Notice this image of restoration, like Eden, that Adam and Eve got to experience. Have you ever restored a piece of furniture? And it, it's amazing what can be done. Or maybe you, uh, we have a lot of old cars in this community, and there's a museum, and, and in our parades, you'll see all these restored cars, and they're beautiful. Restoration is an amazing thing. And God promises he's going to give us a new heavens and a new earth, a restored nature. It's like Easter for earth. It's like a caterpillar that becomes a butterfly. And so we get to experience that. John Eldridge, in his wonderful book on heaven, All Things New, talks about restoration. And he says this, that it is the only hope strong enough, brilliant enough, glorious enough to overcome the heartache of this world. We seem to be drawn to a fantastic world, to a, a place of beauty and nature. If you look at our blockbuster books and movies, you see this. Think of Narnia with C.S. Lewis, or Middle Earth with J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings series, or Pandora, um, which is kind of an Eden-like world for the movie Avatar. And so part of this new resurrection and this new place is that sin and the curse and all the world's brokenness is gone. It's almost like God took a sign and put it up and said, none of that is allowed anymore. Revelation 21.4 says, He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. No more tears of sadness, shame, guilt, or loss. Author Scott McKnight talks about since 1980, around the world, well over one billion babies have been aborted. I want you to think about that. What does heaven mean for these innocent millions and millions of children who had their entire lives taken from them? What does restoration look like for them? I don't know exactly, but I know that Jesus will make things right. I was reading that approximately 600,000 Americans die each year from cancer, 
and more than 7 million um, humans die of cancer worldwide each year. Think about all the grief and the loss tied to that. But at the front of heaven, on the what's not allowed, no cancer. No more of that. We won't experience that anymore. You won't lose a family member or a friend. I think of Pastor John Ross of Memphis, Tennessee, who talks about the medical struggles of his sister. Here she was, vibrant and healthy. She was a wife. She was a mother. And she went through a terrible battle. And they even amputated her legs to try to save her life. And the doctors told her she was, had um, sepsis. And they told her that it was only like a 1 in 500,000 chance that it would go to her brain. And it did. And she died. And he talked about, here they were a Christian family, and he talked about walking out of the hospital with his parents, age 52 and 53, and they were walking together, and they're leaving that building, and their lives are forever changed. They lost their only daughter. And he said he watched as his mom looked at his dad and said this. They were Christians, and she said, Remind me what we believe. What do we believe? And he said his dad thought for a moment and said the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. That's what they believe. That's what we Christians believe. That Jesus Christ overcame death. That death does not hold us. It's not something we need to fear. Jesus Christ overcame it. Death does not get the last word. The last word is Jesus. The last word is resurrection. In Revelation 21, 7, it says this, Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. We will be restored to those positive traits of childhood. I struggle with being cynical sometimes. Maybe you do too. But to be a child again, to have innocence and purity and holiness and deep trust of everyone in heaven. That will be restored to us. That's part of what's given to us. That will be mature, but we'll have that restoration that happens in our lives. I love Revelation 21, verse 4 and 5, the last part where it has Jesus saying, I am making everything new. Everything new. It's all going to be restored. It's all going to be different. And yet there's some continuity from what was before. We get new res resurrection bodies. We get restored bodies. I only get to see my parents a couple times a year now because they live in Indiana. And when I go back, you notice more of the changes when you only see somebody a couple times a year. And one of the changes I noticed last time was that my father, who struggles with arthritis, he will moan when he moves, when he uh, walks sometimes. And he didn't used to do that. We will have new bodies, new resurrection bodies. Those of you who are older, you'll get to, to run again. You'll do cartwheels again. You'll somersault if you want to. You know, there are certain things that we kind of give up as we age. I love 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 44. It says this, So it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. The human body is, is dying. It's decaying. It's changing. It's breaking down. But the resurrection body is eternal. And it's something we look forward to. It's going to be a remarkable body. The Hindu does not have this hope. They believe in reincarnation. And their behavior dictates what happens in the next life, whether they return as a monkey or a mosquito. Buddhists hope to erase the debt of karma. They hope to escape an endless cycle of death and reincarnation. They want liberation from the body. But Christians understand and are promised a new body, the right body, a body with no bulging bellies or varicose veins or bald spots. Some of you men are going to have a full head of hair again someday. 
It's going to be an enhanced version of us. We will be made perfect. I love what John Eldridge asked. He said, have you ever imagined what you would be like if the fall had never taken place? What would an unbroken, unstained, glorious, unblemished version of you be like? It might be the difference between an acorn and an oak tree, the difference between a blueprint and a building. And yet Jesus had a resurrection body, and they didn't recognize him right away. There was a continuity, but there were differences. You'll still be you, but you'll be the best you ever. An incredible, majestic change that happens to all of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. The third and last major idea, as I think about heaven, is God promises us real pleasure in heaven. You know, sometimes Christians get this reputation that we're against pleasure, and we're not. Not at all. As a matter of fact, we have a significant theology of pleasure. We believe in a loving God who wants us to experience His favor and His joy. We just think that certain pleasures are often in certain boundaries that God has given us. And we look forward in heaven to the ultimate place of pleasure. I like what Chip Ingram says. He says, The best that you have known and experienced and felt on this earth is but a pale glimmer of what God has planned for us in the new heavens and the new earth. Stop and think about what are the best days of your life? What are the great moments that you've had? What are those? Maybe it's winning, you know, shooting that final goal and winning the game for your team in a sport. Maybe it was getting your dream job. Maybe it was graduation day. Uh, maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was your honeymoon night. Maybe that's the great moment. Maybe it's having children, obviously, ladies, after the delivery, but having children and getting to experience being a parent. I don't know what the great moments in your life have been, but I know they are just a glimpse and a glimmer of what God has planned for us. Scott McKnight says of heaven, because sometimes people think heaven will be boring. I remember a Far Side cartoon where it had people sitting on individual clouds and they had a harp, and one guy says, I wish I'd brought a magazine. That is a terrible view of heaven. Heaven's going to be remarkable. Scott McKnight says this, if we let the Bible shape our view of heaven, we expect our schedules to be filled with banquets and feasts and parties. Hank Hanegraaff says it's a place where we get to exercise all of our faculties and gratify all of our holy tastes to develop all of our talents and capacities we've been given. And it is the fulfillment, the ultimate fulfillment of our intellectual curiosity. I'd like to think there's a, a room where you can go and watch all the great events of history where you can sit down and if they're followers of God, followers of, of Jesus Christ, you can talk to those leaders and get the inside scoop. We will learn and grow and develop in heaven. We're perfected, but I think that there's still growth that's going to happen for us. In Revelation 21, 6, it says, He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. I think this is a picture of us being satisfied, of us experiencing pleasure. I will tell you, if you are really thirsty, there is nothing like getting that drink of water. I remember being on a mission trip in uh, Honduras, and we had to carry these blocks. We were building a baptistry for this uh, village up, up in the mountains. We had to carry these blocks up on our backs, and it was hard work. And I remember we got to the top, and some of the villagers, they had these um, coolers with ice, and in it they had Coca-Cola. And... I know soda's not great for us, but I will tell you, after hauling those blocks, cement blocks, up the mountainside for hours and hours, drinking that cold Coca-Cola, it was the best, most refreshing drink of my life. It was remarkable. And I think this is an image here, that God will give us our pleasures, He will give us our satisfactions. C.S. Lewis once said of, of heaven, he described it like a book. He said, chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. It just keeps getting better and better. I want you to imagine 
all of the good things about humanity, but redeemed, but kept from, from the way we tarnish and ruin things. Imagine theater, but redeemed theater. Imagine music. I mean, music stirs us. It hits us in a place that is kind of beyond our minds. It's just amazing what music does. Imagine redeemed music. I think God will have us creating things and growing and discovering and inventing. Imagine the food in heaven. It'll be the best ever. Think of all the beauty we see in nature right now. What's heaven going to be like? Think of the beauty that we're going to get to see. A sunrise, a sunset, the leaves turning. I mean, it's just going to be incredible. I think one of the pleasures of heaven is that we receive rewards. I look forward to this. You probably all had this happen, moments where you felt like you worked hard, you did something for the kingdom, and nobody noticed. Nobody said thank you. And God notices. He sees what you do, and he will reward you for whatever you did Jesus tells us that we can actually, um, in a sense, deposit treasures in heaven. I believe he's talking about our rewards. See, this life is a time of preparation. Just as a pregnant woman goes through a season of preparation for that nine months, she is preparing for a new era. She is preparing for a new way of life. This life is like that. We are preparing for something better. We are preparing for something it's hard to even imagine what it's all going to be like. We receive rewards. Notice in Revelation 21, 7, those who are victorious will inherit all this. Our behavior does matter. We are saved by grace. Getting into heaven is a gift of God. But there are rewards. Your faithfulness does matter. Your generosity does matter. How you serve um, your fellow man and your neighbor, that matters. God will reward you. And so it's so important that we understand this. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 11 and 12, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. This is Jesus speaking. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus is saying what you will receive in heaven, the rewards you'll get are so much better than that persecution you may have received in, on earth. Or what about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 through 15? Kind of an interesting passage. Talks about rewards. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is. So see, that foundation is the gospel of grace. Putting our trust in Jesus Christ. We're saved by grace. But we are to build a life. We are to work. And it goes on because... It says, because the day will bring it to life. The day is the judgment day, and it will, bring, it will reveal everything. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. And I struggle with this passage, but it's interesting to me. We are rewarded for our faithfulness. We are rewarded for our service. And if you're in heaven by the grace of Jesus Christ, which is the only way to be there, clearly there's not a bad neighborhood in heaven. But understand there is rewards for those who are faithful. You want to walk in faithfulness and truth. One author said this, What we do in life echoes in eternity. I also want to just mention, and I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I want to mention the pleasure of animals in our lives. Many of you have pets. This is probably the number one question I get about heaven from children, but I also get it from adults as well. I think there are animals in the new heavens and the new earth. Uh, I think there are a few scriptural reasons to think that. I, I don't claim to totally know, because these are pictures and symbols, and, and it's hard to know what to take literally sometimes. But let me just give you a couple things to think about. There were animals in the original garden. And remember the theme of restoration. And so I think the new heavens and new earth, I think it has some animals in it. I think it was interesting. I was reading that some scientists are telling us now that dogs can understand about 165 words, at least certain dogs. I mean, our dog seems to understand certain commands. 
He understands if you say dog park, he gets super excited, like, oh, I get to go. This is my great playground. And so think about the new heavens and the new earth with animals. Maybe they can, they can understand a lot more. Maybe we can have almost a Dr. Doolittle experience. I don't know. I know I'm using my imagination here, but I do think there are some little hints about animals in Scripture. In Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6 through 8, notice what it says. It talks about the wolf will live with the lamb. I mean, that's clearly not now. I mean, I guess a wolf could live with a lamb until he's hungry, but this is a future time. The leopard will lie down with the goat, same idea, the calf and the lion, the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the cobra's den, and the young child will put its hand into the viper's nest. The idea is of a redeemed, changed nature, and I think that includes animals. And so, and if you want to be literal with Revelation, Jesus comes back riding a horse. Now, maybe that's just a symbol. Maybe it's literal. I don't know. So I think there's going to be this restored, non-dangerous creation. And many Christian leaders, certainly not all, think that if heaven is a prepared place for a prepared people, that even that beloved pet, God might give you that. And so while I don't know that, I think it's a possibility and something to think about. And kids love to kind of think in that direction. I'm not going to unpack it because I don't have time, but there's pleasure in serving and reigning with God. I've met a lot of people over the years that they'll use the phrase, I failed at retirement. It'll be like, I retired from my job and I was bored. I need to do something. I think in heaven we're going to have jobs. We're going to have things that God wants us to do. I think it's important. In the parable of the minas, this idea where a master gave his servants some money and said, you're supposed to manage this, and then I'll come back and, and I'll reward you based on how you handle that money. Well, what happened there was notice that the one who um, you know, took his minas, took the money he was given, and he doubled it. He was told, and his reward was, you will uh, take charge of five cities. That's responsibility. It's what we do in this world. When somebody does well, we reward them with increased responsibility. We give them opportunities to grow and to change and to lead. And so I think there is going to be pleasure in serving God as well. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4 says this. Peter writes and tells us, I'm just going to lift out one phrase. He calls, he talks, talks about a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I just want to ask you this morning, do you have a living hope? Have you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? I'm going to put a phone number up. It's the church phone number. If you want to call that and leave a message, I will call you back in the next couple days. I'd love to talk to you. If you've never placed your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, I'd love to talk to you about that, point you to the scriptures, walk you through it, help you with that. And I want to ask you, if you're a Christian, does everyone in your family and your circles of influence have this living hope of heaven? I know it's politically incorrect to say some people go to heaven and some don't. You know, we go to funerals and everybody acts like everybody goes to heaven, but it's just not true. Jesus is the passport to heaven. He's the only way we get in. What he did on the cross, how he paid the penalty for our sins, he is the only way we can get to heaven. We are not good enough on our own. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so it is important, if you are going to have a living hope, it has to be in Jesus Christ. Now, you know, all the stories of childhood, so often they end with a phrase, happily ever after. And I love that phrase. In this life, that's not always how it works. But understanding Christ, we can embrace happily ever after. It's no fairy tale. It's real. We have the resurrection of Jesus to show us the way, to show us that when Jesus says that he can defeat death, when Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you, we can believe it. I just want to leave you with a closing question. Like I said, there are some questions for you to discuss if you want. But a closing question is this. What would change if you lived with an eternal perspective? 
Thank you for joining us today, and we'll see you again next week uh, by a live feed. Have a great day.